Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks very much for letting me do this today and thanks very much for coming along and listening. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview then of what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to give a bit of a background on the Labour Force Survey. I imagine a few of you know it, but probably some of you don't. Talk a little bit of our about our design principles that kind of governs the way we work. Um, give you a few kind of tangible examples of questions that we've redesigned from the Labour Force Survey. Um, and then follow that up with a little bit of quantitative validation as well, but there's not much of that. And then we're going to have time at the end for some questions. So without further ado, <clears throat> um, to give you a bit of background on the Labour Force Survey, it's uh, the UK's largest household survey that we run. Uh, it was started in the 70s. Um, and because it's so big, we sample around uh, 200,000 people a year. It meant that every data user has wanted to try and get their questions on the Labour Force Survey so that they can get the low geographic uh, granularity. What that does mean, however, is that the Labour Force Survey has come, become something that's quite different from just the Labour Force Survey. It covers health and qualifications and a, and a raft of other topics as well. That does mean, however, that it's long, really long. Uh, if you include all the variables and the derived variables, there's something like 900. Obviously, not every respondent would get every single one of those. But um, when we're talking about moving online, it's obviously impossible to shift and lift the entire thing. So I don't know if you've ever played this game where you've got the folded up bits of paper and you draw one part of a monster and you kind of pass it on to somebody else to kind of complete the next bit and then they pass it on to somebody else. That's kind of how the Labour Force Survey has been put together up until now with odd bits of testing around particular topic areas done, but then those topic areas more or less just slotted into the existing process that we've got. So what I'm trying to do is kind of make one coherent monster is is basically the, the gist of, of of my task. Um, so uh, to put this in context, the reason why we're moving online is because data collection should be online in this day and age. There are public expectations to do it, but there's this wider government drive to move everything online so that it's digital by default when it comes to the public interacting with government. So in the future, we're moving to mixed mode data collection. We're going to keep our existing modes of data collection on the LFS survey, which is interview a face-to-face -face and interview a telephone, but we'll be adding an online collection to it. Um, some work that went on before I actually joined the ONS was a, a program called the Electronic Data Collection Program. And I imagine if you're dialing in from another NSI, you might very well be in this space, or if you're having conversations with stakeholders and they want you to do their survey, and the survey's been running for a long time, you might be in this space. Basically, we had uh, a hard fight ahead of us in order to get this idea across that simply lifting and shifting what we've got in the existing interviewer modes and placing them unchanged online doesn't work. Uh, our questions are far too complicated and convoluted and there's too much jargon in there that's been written from the perspective and the definitions of us as data users and hasn't really taken into consideration kind of the public's um, understanding of these terms and ideas and these concepts. And when you're moving online and you're losing the interview and people are going to have to do this in a self-complete context, um, all of that makes a big difference and the questions we've got now basically don't work. Which is to say that our interviewers are basically doing a really great job of making sure that we're getting quality data from the respondents for the questions as difficult as they can be for some people. So our approach now is completely different. It's about translate, uh, sorry, about transformation and not translation. So what that really means is going back to the output concept. What are we trying to measure? Forget about the question as we've already uh, always asked it. What are we actually trying to measure? And we'll start from there. Uh, in terms of moving online, that means cutting the survey content. Like I said earlier, the LFS is far too long to move the whole thing on line, so we concentrate on a set of priority outputs. We can make changes to the questionnaire flow. Like I said, it kind of looks like a monster that's all higgledy-piggledy at the moment. What you want is a nice, succinct, uh, easy to understand journey through the questions and not ask respondents anything that's irrelevant. And then, of course, making changes to the questions themselves to strip out that jargon, to strip out the definition and all the extra guidance that perhaps isn't needed to simplify and use plain English so that people completing in a self-complete context can actually do so. So we've got a set of design principles which I'm going to be talking uh, you through uh, shortly. But just to say as an overview, what we do is we design for the online space first. More specifically, we design for mobiles. This constrains how much space we've got to work with and make sure that what we're doing is the simplest. It's easy to 
transform a, a, a mobile question to the other modes of data collection than it is to do it the other way around. And we're being respondent focused in the way that we're doing it. Um, we're also being agile. So for those of you that don't know what that means, it's about taking small chunks, working on those, finding out what's wrong, reiterating, retesting them, and then bringing in extra complexity. Even though what we're moving online is a strip down of the LFS version of the LFS survey. It's not like we're working of all of that content all at once. Rather, we do much more manageable chunks and then kind of work uh, our complexity up from there. Uh, we do focus groups with the interviewers. It's really important, actually, to get their expertise and the understanding. Uh, they work with the questions day in, day out. They know where the pain points are. And actually, um, I can get them to be quite candid about when they go off script in order to get respondents to give accurate data, and that can be quite illuminating. Um, and we do some designing with data as well, which I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Um, but our, the office is moving to a sort of non-survey administrative data um, model first with um, survey supplementing that then. And one quick thing I'd like to say um, in case there's any um, uncertainty about this in the room. Definitely, if you're doing something, building a service or doing a survey that you want to host online and you want general people to access it and you they're going to access it any which way that they want, you should allow for that. So this is why we designed for the mobiles in the first space. If you follow this graceful degradation path and what you end up with is a cat that doesn't fit on the screen, you can't see the image properly, none of it works. Whereas if you design it for the mobiles, screen first, everything's well positioned, well centered, uh, and it looks appropriate. About 17% of households in the UK only have access online via a smartphone. So if you don't make optimize whatever service or survey you're building for smartphones, then um, you're going to lose them. If you're expecting them to break off and pick up another device and go and do your survey that way, they won't, you'll probably just lose them. Better instead to design for the mobile, allow people to respond uh, in the way that they want, uh, test it in that way as well, and you end up with a service that's much more accessible for everybody. Okay. Um, there is a, gov a UK government cabinet body called uh, the government digital service, GDS, and they've got a set of principles. They don't work with us on this project or anything, but their principles for how you uh, design online services are really useful. All of their stuff is open source. They do a lot of coding that's open source. So even if you're uh, listening in from another country, I would definitely recommend visiting their pages. They've got a lot of good advice there about how to do testing and make sure that what you're building is uh, suitable for users. Okay. <clears throat> So we uh, use these principles, we find them very useful in making sure that uh, we're building something that's going to work for users while making sure that we're meeting the output needs. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about designing with data. If you're listening in from an NSI and you've got a survey with a, his with a history, then this is something you can do. If you're an academic or something and you're just starting up a survey, then perhaps this is not applicable, but I'll try and get through it fairly quickly. Hopefully you've all taken a deep, sharp breath because this looks so horrendous and there's a lot going on. Good, it should, it's meant to scare you. This basically is actually um, a root map for one of our derived variables on the LFS, the most important one, which is about your economic activity. So the circles are kind of outcomes. You can be on a government training scheme, you can be employed, self-employed. Uh, UWF stands for an unpaid family worker. You can be economically inactive, that's the dark green, or you can be unemployed, that is you're looking for work. So right out of the household section, this is what people are faced with on the LFS. And what I'm going to do is talk you through one quarter's worth of data as we get them through these questions. So there's our sample of about uh, 73,000 odd people. And the first thing we ask is, are you uh, doing uh, one of these government training schemes? Now these government training schemes are, very few people are on them. No, virtually nobody knows what they are. Um, even the people that are on the government training schemes don't necessarily have the ability to tell you what the name of their scheme is or to recognize that they are on the scheme. Nonetheless, straight out the gate, uh, we ask our full sample, were you on one of these government training schemes, uh, for the sake of capturing about 200 people per quarter. We've still got 73,000 odd people in our sample that we've burdened with this question that meant next to nothing. Next, we ask them if they're doing any work in the reference week, and if they're not doing work in the reference week, is that because they're away from a job? Okay, that's good. We deal with about half our sample there where we capture all of our employees and self-employed people. Still got about 28,000 people. We don't know what they are. 
The next series of questions we ask them is, are you doing any unpaid work for your own business, which between you and me, I'm not sure if that makes any sense, or if you're doing any unpaid work for a relative's business. And again, this captures, at least in this country's context, only about 200 people that do unpaid family work. Then we have a series of questions about if you're looking for work and if you are looking for work, whether you're able to start. If you're looking but you're not able to start, that's one kind of economically inactive. If you're looking and you are able to start, that's the International Labour Organization's definition of an unemployed person, so it's about 2,500 of them per quarter. But as you can see, we've still got 25,000 odd people that we haven't managed to code. These are people that are not looking for work, not working, and not able to start. Basically, you're long-term unemployed. These are your retirees, your long-term sick and disabled, uh, your stay-at-home parents, and your students. People that could have told us that that's exactly their economic situation right out the gate. Instead, what we do is we walk them through this rather horrendous process of asking irrelevant questions, um, about 11 to 13 of them just to code that. When you rationalize that and think about it and just strip it all out, you end up with something that's a much simpler picture. And in fact, we can be doing things in the background to kind of disqualify people. Uh, I'll, I'll say what I mean by that in a minute. So just to talk you through the same quarter's worth of data, just ask straight up, are you doing any paid work? That deals with the largest chunk of our sample, which are your employees and your self-employed people. Now, if I were to ask you, did you do any work in the reference week and you said no, I would still have to ask, okay, well, maybe that's because you do have a job, but you're away from it. So even though you weren't working, um, do you have a job that you're away from? If you had, say, even the day before I interviewed you or you got this survey, had gone to a job interview and been accepted and that you're starting in two weeks, in terms of how the public think about themselves, you would say, hey, I've got a job. You'd phone up your mom or your friends and say, hey, I passed my interview, I've got a job. By our definitions, if you haven't started working yet, but you're going to be starting in two weeks, we actually count you as an unemployed person. And there's about 100 of those people that we can kind of disqualify through that process. But the point is, is that as a respondent, your experience is never the wiser. You say, I didn't do any paid work, but the reason I didn't is because I'm waiting to start a job that I haven't actually uh, started yet, um, fine, we'll put you in our unemployment statistics. In terms of your experience, you've just said that I do have a job and that's a much more comfortable uh, ride. Then let's deal with the le uh, largest uh, chunk of the sample. So we'll ask them if they're looking for work and if they're able to start and if not to either of those, then why not? Then we can code out that uh, 30 odd thousand people that are you're unemployed and you're economically inactive. Then there's only the 300 people left that are unpaid family workers and are not government training scheme that we kind of give this sort of worst experience to. It's only the minority then that we burden with the least comfortable experience, the majority we've thought about and we've considered and we deal with them first. Yeah. Um, so these are more uh, GDS principles. And in fact, because we've stripped out so much of the complexity and the burden uh, and the rigmarole from that process that I've just showed you, we can actually build more complexity back in. So what we do now in the labor force survey is we're interested in people's economic activity and their working and their working hours, stuff like that. If you have two jobs, what we do at the moment is the interviewer says, decide which is your main job and which is your second job. I'm going to ask you all the questions about your main job now and just hold all of that stuff about your second job for later when we'll ask about it down the road. That's not how people think. As soon as you start asking people about their paid job, they're going to be questioning in their head, well, which one are we talking about? So why not bring that behavior and that um, kind of build something that fits with their mental model then? Oops, sorry. Um, so ask early how many jobs, as soon as you've established how many that they've got a job, well, how many? And then you can kind of uh, leapfrog, well, what's the status of your main job? Is that full-time, part-time? What's the status of your second job? Is that full-time, part-time? How many hours in your main job? How many hours in your second job? And so on. In terms of a respondent experience, that's a lot more natural. That's a lot easier for them to, to answer. They also then keep in mind which job they're talking about at any one time. So that's kind of a bit of work that we did to sort of improve the respondent experience just by moving the questions around and cutting out the ones that didn't really seem to be doing anything. What about the actual question wording there when it comes to move online? 
One thing I cannot stress enough, in fact, it's probably the most important thing you take away from this talk today, is to do the testing. Get out there and iterate and iterate again. The best version of a question or a service or content for a page that you're going to write at desk is not good enough. You, will, you need to go out there. You need to f meet the weird and wonderful people that are your public, uh, and you need to find the odd people that um, really turn what you've designed on its head. Uh, because you have to understand that they're representative of a much larger group of people actually in your country. So get out of the building, do the testing. Um, it's in incredibly important to do this and not skip this step. Uh, if you're um, an NSI, I would suggest you budget for this quite largely. If you're small academic researchers, then at least try and do one or two rounds of testing because you're going to find things out that you wouldn't otherwise know. I've highlighted usability and cognitive testing together because we actually do these things at, um, at once. So cognitive testing, for those who don't know, is about trying to understand what are the mental processes that people are going through when they're comprehending your question, making judgments about how to answer, and then mapping that response to the options you've given. And usability testing is can they use the online tool. Now the thing is these things can't be disentangled. How I interact with the tool definitely affects the way I comprehend the question. If there are response options that are off screen, then I don't immediately have access to them. So doing these um, all at once is the best thing to do. What we do is we, um, and you don't have to be any kind of development expert to do this, we build our surveys on a wireframe tool called Axure RP, A-X-U-R-E, um, and basically what you can do with that is build it to look like a real survey, like a real website. Uh, you can host it online via a URL, so what we do when we do testing is we usually go to the person's house. We get them to get out whatever device they're comfortable with. We don't force anything on them. So if they want to get out their mobile phone and access our survey, then that's what we test them on. We let them run through while we just observe, and then we do retrospective cognitive probing afterwards. I'm going to talk you through a few examples now. Uh, the first ones are kind of more specific to those of you that are interested in labor market analysis, but the later ones hopefully will be of interest to people that are doing online survey design more generally. So this is kind of the most important question. It's about trying to establish whether or not somebody's in, um, in, employment, in our employment statistics or not. Well, it's part of the process anyway. The original question is, did you do any paid work uh, in the week ending Sunday, the whatever, either as an employee or self-employed? Uh, the interviewers complain about this question in terms of people hear the word paperwork or they quite often say, oh no, I wasn't doing any additional work, just my normal job, which is exactly what we're trying to capture them on, so it's not working ideally. The next version of the question that basically I designed and then went out and tested was sort of more aligned with the national account definition of doing work for payment or profit. Unfortunately, in the self-complete context, using this question focused people on the payment or the profit. Now, we're not trying to capture unpaid work. Payment is definitely a part of it, but what we're not trying to capture either is whether or not you've been paid, just whether or not you were doing the work. So um, uh, we find basically when you do that, people who have just started a job and not yet been paid will say uh, no to this question, even though that they were working, and people who are working, um, uh, sorry, people who weren't working but did get paid will say yes to the question because the payment was still an ongoing. Um, thing. So we moved to a new version that actually tried to talk about a more stable concept, which is that of having a paid job. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm sick in the week. It doesn't matter whether or not uh, I'm on holiday. It's more of a stable, ongoing thing. It doesn't matter whether I got received my salary for this month or not. Uh, and it seems to work largely quite well. Job is definitely an easier concept for people. Um, however, we had a few issues with uh, the word business for people who are sole traders. These are people who employ themselves as an employee to their business, which they then can control so they can see themselves as either the business or as the uh, employee, in which case they're in work if they're an employee, even when the business is not doing any work. And that's what we're trying to capture. So we move to this uh, other option about um, did you have a paid job either as an employee or as self-employed? Uh, and that seems to be working much better for now, but we're still constantly testing things and we don't um, subscribe to any of our uh, kind of designs. Everything's up for change. Um, <clears throat> so that seems to be working uh, much better now. But it's not just about the question that you're looking at. It's important to understand that what you're 
doing also has uh, sort of follow-on effects and uh, implications for subsequent pages and questions. So it's definitely uh, the case whenever you're designing either a survey or a service that you're looking at your pages holistically, that you don't break down the work and give it to people so that they're only looking at small windows in isolation. You really want to consider the whole thing. So when we're using the question about did you do any work for payment or profit, you've obviously got to have this follow-up question to capture whether or not people do have jobs but they were just away from uh, their work in that week. There are problems with that process. Uh, so did you have a paid job or business that you're away from in that week? We had a teacher during the summer holidays so obviously hadn't been in work. Um, they said no to were you in work, the first question, which was correct, but then they, uh, at this question, were you away from a job or business that you've been paid from, they also said no because they're still being paid through the summer months, um, and so in, in their mind, they weren't away from the paid aspect of the job. This in no way was a question that I would expect to go wrong. It seemed fairly straightforward to me. So this really, again, I can't impress upon you enough how important it is to go and get the testing done and find out what does and doesn't work. I mean, she's a teacher, relatively well-educated person, can still go really wrong. When we switched um, to the idea of asking about a paid job as a concept, um, then we found that there were sort of um, follow-up effects and issues on a different question. So as I mentioned to you earlier, we try and ask early, do you have more than one job so that then we can route people through a better experience through the survey. Tried to keep the tone casual, tried to keep it in plain English, very light. Did you have more than one paid job or business in that week? Um, and actually the casual tone made it too easy to misinterpret this. So I spoke to somebody, he had uh, heavy dyslexia, um, very low digital literacy skills. Um, and he was a self-employed person. Essentially, he, he ran a bike shop. He fixed bikes. Um, and so what he was, his answer to this question was, well, every job that is every bike I fix, I get paid for as individual. So that's lots of jobs. And I have a business. So what do I press? Both. The simple answer for this question for me would be yes. Two pages later, he's getting asked, um, what is the status of your second job? Are you employed or self-employed? Is that full-time, part-time? And instantly he knew he had gone wrong. What second job? I'm confused. Where did I say I had a second job? Even though I've just quoted to you in the line above, that's exactly where he said he had a, uh, two jobs. So what that highlighted to me was that there's something special about the word second that he saw that made him know that he was he had gone wrong. There's something separate and secondary about this extra business. Whereas if you're just trying to be casual about did you have more than one paid job or business, then really he's that's a lot more open to interpretation. So our next iteration of this question will probably use the word second or separate in the question just to make sure that uh, people understand that it's about separate work streams. But again, um, this is not a question that we found was going wrong in multiple rounds of testing. Um, it's important actually, we used to do our testing and our recruitment ourselves via Gumtree and after a while we were saturated and we kept seeing the same people. We've since started using a recruitment company um, and if you've got the budget for it, it's well worth it because they can find um, people in the public that you might have trouble recruiting yourself and if I hadn't spoken to this guy, I probably wouldn't have thought that there was any problem with this question but actually there is. Right. Um, so here maybe are some examples that if you're not interested in labor market analysis, you still might be able to take something away because it's really more about the process of getting it right. On the labor force survey, we're interested in capturing people's usual hours. Here is a pattern that I designed thinking, oh, well, you know what? Some people do shift work uh, and then maybe they don't work the same hours every day. Maybe, uh, maybe if I was to ask them how many hours they work in a total week, they've got to do all this mental arithmetic to work it out. Perhaps I can build something that when they put the hours in for each day, it'll calculate the total at the bottom. Absolutely nobody thanked me for this. I was trying to be helpful and to break the question down to make it easier steps for some people. But even if you're a shift worker, you've recently completed a timesheet, you know what you're going to put in for your hours for the recent week. So let me impress again, you are not your user. Go out and do the testing. What you design at desk and you think is brilliant or what your stakeholders or data users think is brilliant is probably not actually ideal from what a respondent needs in a self-complete context. So do the testing. Don't design a desk. Following uh, on from that, so 
the labor force survey, they want to capture your usual hours and the actual hours that you worked in a specific reference week. This is about tying it in to see whether or not people are over or under working or to explain why hours are down based on holiday, that kind of thing. Uh, so as I mentioned to you earlier, we kind of went under this pattern of breaking things down to here, let me ask that question about your main job, then let me ask it again for your second job. What we were finding was that if you separate the usual and actual hours questions, people don't differentiate between them. Some of them think that it's the exact same question again, even if they don't, they tend to be lazy and just input their usual or their contracted hours again. The only way we could find to actually get quality data for this question was to put the two uh, on the same page where you're asking about what is the usual number of hours you work in job one or you know your main job and then in the week specifically this week how many hours did you actually work and this is the only way we've managed to get people to actually give us uh, discerning actual hours times for a week. So context effects are important. How you place the questions next to each other affect their comprehension and how carefully uh, people read them. So this kind of, you know, pulls on things like Rice's maxims. Um, people won't give you, if you, if you ask somebody a question again, they're going to assume that you're after something qualitatively different. But that only seems to work when you make the context really obvious by putting them on the same page. Um, be consistent but not uniform. So this is about, we've got all these principles that I've been telling you about, it's generally about trying to make it easier, trying to simplify things, uh, trying to reduce the number uh, of words that you've got on a page. However, sometimes you need to abandon your own principles, particularly if you're not just building a service but do care about statistical robustness. So for the labor force survey, somebody is um, unemployed if they've been looking for work for uh, in the last four weeks and if they're able to start in the next two. Following my own principles of trying to simplify and keep the term casual, my first iteration of this question was, did you look for paid work at any time between whatever the dates? What we were finding was that this is the first question you get where the reference week has previously been talking about the week before the survey, now stretches to a four week period. What we were finding when we wrote the question this way was that nobody was noticing that. People were rushing through it just far too quickly um, and they weren't taking heed of the dates. So what we had to do was actually make something that's clunkier and much heavier, uh, much heavy hand, much more heavy handed. So we put the dates at the front of the question. It's, it slows people down. It's not as nice an experience. But what it does get people to do is actually pay attention to the dates so that the quality of the data that you're collecting is much better. The same goes for the question about are you able to start in two weeks? So this first iteration, the job had been available in the week, whatever, would you have been able to start in two weeks? We then move to a question that's if a job had been offered on a specific date, would you have been able to start before a specific date? Nobody's confused. Everybody knows when the job was supposed to be offered, when they're supposed to start by. Everybody can then provide a, a quality and accurate answer. Even though we're heavy handed with the dates on those questions to get people to slow down and consider them properly, it's not like you've got to consistently do that all the uh, way through. So, for example, when you say, no, I haven't looked for work in the four weeks, the next question is this one. And I can simply refer to this period or that week or, or whatever it might be that's appropriate. And at least one page along, people can follow that. Um, if you're not familiar, there's some great articles by the Nielsen Norman group. If you do a quick Google search for Norman and um, F-shaped reading or internet reading, uh, they've done a lot of great work about the way people digest web pages. Uh, and they call it this F-shaped reading pattern, which is you read along the header, probably not even all the way across, before you start scanning down the page and looking for stuff that's relevant. If people are going to engage in those behaviors, then work with it rather than against it. So we can actually, if people are going to jump from the question stem straight to the response options, then fine, let them use the response options to actually finish answering the question. If you take the example of that first top left question, otherwise I'd have to duplicate, are you an employee or self-employed, and then options, an employee, self-employed. 
why why replicate why would be repetitious this saves you the effort another nice thing you can do online is even though do you ever do work which would you consider as overtime is technically a yes no question we sort of skip the step and allow them to say no which is i do not work overtime or specify what kind of overtime they do and that seems to be working well even though it's kind of two tasks all at once Okay, uh, I promised I would talk a little bit about the uh, quantitative data stuff, so uh, just move on to that now and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so we've run three quantitative tests so far. I have to say, though, that the main purpose of these tests to date is really looking at uh, engagement and take up. How can we get people online, um, at incentive strategies, uh, and that kind of thing. We have, in October, a quant test planned, which is going to be our first mixed mode test. So that's going to be the first proper evaluation of how well these new question designs are working for um, outputting labor market data. So please do get in touch later down uh, later in the year if you're interested in that. Um, so just to explain then the, the first three tests, reasonably um, decent sample sizes. Uh, as I say, it was mostly about um, looking at the materials that we've designed in order to encourage people to come on. That's an entirely separate talk. If you're interested in that stuff, um, please do email me and I'll put you in touch with people in my team that can better answer these questions. Um, but in so far as what we have gathered in terms of validating the questionnaire that we've done, we had a rather heavy-handed, you know, quite an explicit how, how easy or difficult did you find the survey at the end. As you can see from the responses in the table there below, generally people found what we had put together very easy. Um, completion times were short, usually no longer than 20 minutes in the longest version that we ran. <clears throat> um, and when we look at the uh, pattern of kind of complete households, so of the people that accessed our survey, uh, 86 and 85% of people actually went on and completed it. Uh, there was a small percentage of households that partially completed. Um, very few of them actually only accessed the survey and then didn't do anything. I think a few households were put off by the household grid. It's probably at that point that they realize, oh, if I've got to put in all seven of us, then this is going to take a while. Maybe I won't bother. Uh, and very few partial response, and we're not quite sure if that's to do with um, passing the buck to the next household member and then it, you know, it kind of falling out at that point. Um, but what we do know as well is that of the people that went and completed our survey in test one, it was 98%, and then test two, it was 96% of people did it in one sitting. So obviously, it's not so difficult or horrible an experience that um, you know you need to take a break, maybe need a short holiday or something. Uh, most people tend to do it all at once, and so that's quite um, encouraging. So a brief summary then. If you've got the time and the budget and the appetite from the people that own the questionnaire, if we're talking about redesigning a hysteric one, then try to convince them that what they have in their mind about the existing questions that they've always asked to abandon. You'll go back to the concept that you're trying to measure, but you might have to reword the question in line with the way that the public or your respondents think about it, particularly if you're designing for a self-complete context. So then design for the respondent. Don't design only for desktops and laptops. As I mentioned earlier, some people only can access the internet via their smartphones. If you don't design from them, they're not going to switch mode. You're just going to lose them. Not only that, but there's something probably quite specific about that population that only have access from uh, smartphones, maybe their lower socioeconomic status for uh, for instance. And they're probably people that are hard to count anyway, so you definitely don't want to be losing any of those. Um, if you do design for the respondent, then what we found is that you can get much better and much more accurate, correct, self-complete data. Whereas if you don't think about them when you're designing your questions or you just think about the data user and their jargon, um, you're going to lose that. One thing, actually, I, I didn't mention in any of my other slides, but um, it might be pertinent and somebody might have a question about it. I don't know if you noticed, but we don't build guidance. 
all of our questions basically don't have any help text. We try and write the question to be as self-explanatory and as simple as possible. If people don't get it, then we bring in extra complexity test again. If people still don't get it, we can make it more complicated again. Or maybe it's about stripping it down into several questions that's um, more comfortable. But what we don't do is put a ream of definitions and hidden guidance behind a you know click to expand type button. People don't. Even if they're unsure, people won't read guidance, so don't expect them to. Don't build it in a way that you expect them to. Um, and if you're building for a voluntary survey context, then at least being a little considerate of the people that are giving up their time in order to give you the data, I think, is, well, just a nice thing to do, as well as giving you better quality data. Be holistic. Questions don't work in isolation. The flow through the survey doesn't work in isolation from the questions. Um, the suitability of the response options uh, also impacts how you word the question. So what I'm saying is think of this all together. You've got to think, how is this question? What is it following on from? Where is it going next? How does that fit with the respondent's mental model of, of their expectations through the journey? How does the question relate to the answer options? Are people going to be jumping about? Is there something I can work with there rather than work against? Um, and this is also why we do the cognitive and the usability testing. How you interact with the tool itself affects your comprehension of what you're doing. So consider all of these aspects at once. If you've got a team of researchers looking to modernize either a service or a survey, don't give them too small uh, a chunk of the work because then they'll be blinkered and they won't see how it impacts on the things that go around that. Rather, combine it as one big team. Sure, they can work on it all together, but they need to look at the bigger picture. And then do the testing. Even if you're just an academic PhD student listening to me and you're wondering, oh, what is, what is there that's a takeaway? Do at least one round of testing. Build your survey or your service. Then go out, even if you just find sort of 10, 15 people, ask, uh, do a little, read one of Steve Krug's books, is what I'd recommend for the usability testing. Um, Don't make me think is really good. It's very short, very simple to follow. Get some idea about cognitive research principles and then do at least one round. Because if you don't talk to the, the public will always surprise you basically is what I'm saying. There are always, in the most endearing way, those odd people out there that you need to take account of and build for them. It's not gonna make it any harder for the majority of people that wouldn't otherwise have had a problem. Um, and you need to make sure that you're measuring what you think you're measuring basically. So that's me. I'm going to pass it back over to Sarah, and then I think she's going to field me some of your questions, if you have any. Thanks. OK, perfect. Thank you, Alex. OK, then. So um, now we have a question from Kerry. I hope I said your name right. Um, the question is, to what extent is the shift to online data collection meant to supplement rather than replace the current approach to data collection? i.e. might we expect to sample boost from online collection while this is being trialed? Um, that's, that's a good question. So uh, to answer it in stages, firstly we're not changing the existing modes of data collection that we've got. We'll always be using online in conjunction with the other one. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, so there are people that you're not going to encouraged to do online or encouraged to do a survey at all until you start knocking on their door. And then there are other people that would much rather do an interview over the phone or face to face. Uh, in terms of then how you actually, the sort of more operational issues about how you manage your field for force allocation, we're still working some of that out. I think perhaps the role of our field interviewers might change a little bit in the future. Um, Interestingly, from our initial quant test, what we're finding is that, kind of contrary to what we were expecting, the sample composition that we're getting online isn't actually much different than than what you get um, in, in in the traditional collection modes. So it's it's not like introducing online only leaves like the worst and hardest to count uh, cases left for our interviewers. Not any more than that's already happening anyway. I'm not sure if I fully answered that question. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question actually, I don't know if you answered it um, already, but at the moment this is testing, um, it, I gather, is, is, what's the time frame for trying to include this actually in the LFS or other surveys? Mm -hmm. 
So as I mentioned, in October, we've got our third quant test. That'll be our first mixed mode test where we're actually looking at the data, what the data matters. Um, so we're going to be able to, from that, have some idea of what the introduction of the new online mode is doing to the estimates, if anything, or whether that's just um, can be explained by sample compositions. And then later down the line, uh, before this actually goes live, what needs to happen is what we call a parallel run. So what that means is that the labor force survey would carry on whilst uh, a comparable sample was then drawn up for the transformed labor force survey. You run them for the same period, whether that's three months or 12 months, I think it's got to be discussed depending on how expensive that's going to be. Um, and when you're running it over the same period with a comparable sample, then you get an idea of what the changes are doing to the estimates. And then once we can explain how much the estimates are going to change, once something like this goes live, then we can do it. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking next year, the year after? Or more? I mean, we're thinking probably more, more 2021 at, at the earliest. Okay, fair. Okay, so we have a few other questions um, from Lucy. Um, is there ever a good way to design a questionnaire for multiple people to complete, such as different people? Oh, sorry, it's just moved. Um, sorry, I'll find that question again. Um, sorry, it's... Uh, lost that question. There we go. Sorry. Is there ever a good way to design a questionnaire for multiple people to complete, such as different people within one business? Um, so if we're talking about business surveys, then yeah, I would actually, the, probably the best thing you could do is, is do precisely figure out what those user needs are. If you're sending your surveys out to businesses and you know that they're not completed by one person, like maybe maybe uh, somebody fields the email in the first place, then collects all the people that, from the organization that she knows is going to need to do the survey, like maybe there's the accountant needs to put some financial stuff in, someone from HR needs to put employee numbers in, something like that. Uh, if you know that, basically go along if you can to their business, I know they're busy so they're not always willing to let you in, find out exactly what their process would be for, for going out and filling out the questionnaire and then design that process so it's exactly easy for them to do that. Um, that, that would be my suggestion, uh, but absolutely try and, try and design it so that it does work for all of them rather than a one size fits all, unless that works. But yeah, go and, go and find the user needs from, from the horse's mouth is what I would suggest if you can. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Sandra asked, um, you mentioned um, that you do not include guidelines when asking your questions. Why? Um, people don't read them. Even if, even if, even when we've seen that they answer the question incorrectly, even when they're going wrong, even in when they think that they're going to go wrong, they still don't read it. Um, the other aspect is that we want to move away. So, the current Labour Force survey, uh, I mentioned is like 900 variables long. Sitting alongside that is a thousand page document of interviewer notes explaining what all the questions mean, what all the definition, you know, what to do with edge cases and stuff like that. We want to move away from that. Design your questions to be as simple as possible and keep simplifying them until they work for everybody. If you design the question right, you don't need the guidance. If it's a complicated thing, try splitting it out into several questions. But if you're relying on people to open guidance in order to get the question right, particularly if it's hidden guidance, then forget it. They don't, they just don't do it. I mean, people don't even read the please select all that apply that tells you that whether or not you can pick one option or multiple options. People don't even read that very, very rarely. Um, so yeah, anything other than the question and then jumping straight to the answers they ignore. So you've got to play into their reading behaviors online. Great. All right. Um, Next question from Jerry. Um, great work on going back to the concept, redesigning questions, no hidden definitions, etc. Um, for many of us, this seems to be out of our control. Any advice on how to educate our clients, particularly when we do not have the budgets that you have for the LFS transformation? So, for example, with hidden definitions. Um, hey, Jerry. Uh, not. It's. It's. It, yeah, I mean, as, as you know, Laura and I had those fights a long time ago, trying to trying to get people to to accept that you can't just use your existing um, uh, questions and expect the same data uh, in a self-complete context. 
maybe you could ask them to um, budget for a pilot study or something, allow you to collect some initial evidence that you could immediately go to them and say, you know, kind of see, told you so. Uh, maybe we should be, you know, taking a bit more of a, 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 a back to the drawing board kind of stab at this. Um, but I, I, I'm not exactly sure because I, I can appreciate you've got to sort of do it on the cheap and do it quite quickly because it's almost before any of the project uh, gets going. Or if you have any like leftover money from previous projects, maybe you can save yourself a bank of this evidence just to whip out for these for this kind of occasion. I'm 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 not sure. Sorry. Okay. Um, so from Stephen, um, will Move Online eventually enable the ONS to boost the LFS sample? or will it remain broadly the same? Um, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and um, it's, it's not my work to sort it out, and I think there's a little bit of an open question there, because we're also possibly thinking about an integrated social statistics model, which might actually include increasing the sample by having a kind of master wave that's almost like a 1% population coverage survey that then has surveys that follow on from that, which you get subsampled into, so you could get sampled into the waves two to five of the LFS, or you could get sampled into, I don't know, a household financial survey. So that's one of the things that we're thinking about and planning, but I don't think any of those plans have been uh, firmed up yet. Okay, um, right then, so from John, will the things that you're learning through cognitive testing feed back into design of the face-to-face -face or phone questions? It seems that you will end up with a twin track questionnaire here with the web questionnaire potentially being optimized to a greater extent than the face-to-face -face phone questionnaire. How are you dealing with that? That's a really Great question. Um, so we've actually been engaging the field and the telephone interviewing staff with us the whole way through this process. I mean, they're ultimately an end user of the survey. In terms of the questions that they've seen that I've designed for the labor market stuff, they're actually like really eager to take them on because I've managed to remove a lot of the kind of more awkward aspects uh, and the more irrelevant questions through the flow. So they have to ask people fewer questions, they like that, but I'm definitely taking on board their considerations and their insights when I'm building the question. However, we are designing for the online mode first and we've actually recently started then redeveloping for the for the face-to-face -face, uh, mode. So we've got the online questions as a starting point, but we're not beholden to keeping them like that in the same way that we're not beholden now to keeping the existing questions where we're redesigning for online. If we need a slightly different process for face-to-face -face because it works for the interviewers, then we're perfectly comfortable with doing that as long as we do a certain amount of testing to make sure that conceptually they're going to be measuring the same thing. In terms of the output and the definitions of those outputs, they're going to be the same thing. Um, so we are talking with our interviewers and taking their uh, thoughts on board and basically we'll build them something specific for them that might be different from how it looks for the uh, online respondents. Okay. So it's about improving their, their way of working as, as well as just in doing it for the uh, public. Mm -hmm. Okay then, so from Jennifer, um, when you send pre-survey mail outs, do you include an opt-out? If you do, does this reduce how far the mail out increases response rate? Uh, no, we don't. So we sample um, based on addresses. So we do a, a randomized, or maybe it's, a, no, I think it's a randomized sample of, of addresses drawn from the Royal Mail's um, postal address file. Um, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question, Sarah? Um, when you send pre-survey mail outs, do you include an opt-out? Mm -hmm. Right, um, and, the, and the survey itself is voluntary, so basically your opt-out is to just not do anything. Um, we don't otherwise, you're not mandatorily involved whether you, and you have to opt-out to get out. So if we don't hear from you, uh, well, so we send, what we do is a pre-notification. Soon you're going to be, you've been sampled, soon we're going to be sending you a, an online survey link. Then we send them the online survey link, say go online and do it. Then we send them a reminder, uh, and then and then we send an interviewer to follow up to try and chase them up. So if they don't want to respond at any of those st stops, they just have to not do anything. Okay. 
Um, so from Faye, um, if you can only afford or have time for very limited testing, is it not worth bothering with an online survey? Is there anywhere I can find a body of questions that work, e.g. employment status? Um, I, if, you re, if you need a really quick fix, then maybe, but, but probably not. It might be specific to your uh, situation, your survey, and your uh, respondents. In terms of the labor market questions that I'm developing, it'll be a little while, I guess, before you can pick them up. We're not absolutely done with the testing, and we keep reiterating, so I wouldn't want to say anything is, is in its final form just yet, although we're pretty comfortable with where they are. Um, but what I would do is, is, if you can, just do a, even just get 10 people, do a, a brief cognitive interview with them yourself about, you know, what do you understand this question to be asking you? How would you explain this term in your own words? That will make sure that what you're writing in the question stem, people ex understand in the way that you think that they've got it. If it's just pure economic stuff, then maybe send me an email after and I can give you a hand um, and, you can, and you can take those questions as a starting point. Okay then, so um, we've got another question from Faye, which is, do you have an aim for the number of questions you wish to reduce the LFS by? Um, no, and there's no hard and fast rule. So as part of kind of pushing back against stakeholders so that they didn't try and put everything on the survey and, and turn it back into a really long thing, we had this sort of uh, a little bit arbitrary rule of we didn't want to make the survey longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Fact of the matter is, though, when you do this kind of work and you've put the time in in order to make something that's respondent-centric, that is easy to get through, easy to do, we're starting to maybe find out again that you can probably, if you do this, make surveys a little bit longer because they're not so horrible to get through. Uh, so there's no fixed survey length. It definitely depends on how interesting the topic is, how motivated <clears throat> your sample is to do it, that kind of thing. Um, but you could, you know, if you've got the budget, keep testing, and when you start seeing the massive drop-off, then consider, you know, that's the point to stop. Okay, so we have a couple of questions from uh, Karen and Oliver. Um, so, um, yeah, how do you intend to cut down the amount of questions? Do you split up into more waves? How do you cut down the amount? Yeah. Right. Um, so a lot of the questions, because the survey has been going for a long time, I, I and if you've got the budget to do this, it, it's quite resource intensive, but I spend a lot of time basically understanding where everything there came from, which isn't to say that I always found out what the answer was, because there are some of those paper trails were kind of rabbit holes with no end in that you couldn't find out who the data user was for the question, why it ended up there in the first place, and kind of what it's still doing there now. Basically, what we've done is got labor market division here at ONS, so they're the primary users of the data, to prioritize what it is that they output from the labor force survey, and we're designing their priority outputs first. If you can meet the same output um, in fewer questions, then we've kind of got the remit to do that. Uh, so I don't know if you remember back at the beginning, I mentioned this idea about uh, having this response option for why why were you away from a job to say um, because I was waiting to start a job that I've already taken. Now that, as it exists now, is actually its own question. Are you waiting to start a new job? It doesn't need to be. It can be a response option to that question. So without losing any data points, without losing any outputs, I have dropped a question that way. So you can, you can be a little bit clever about it if you think about the journey and the flow, whether or not you can combine questions into response options on other questions if you're a little bit smarter about it. But other than that, get rid of anything that's trimming and prioritize the outputs, uh, build in the ones that are the highest priority and stick in the ones that are lower priority if you have room. Okay. Um, there's another question from um, Karen again by Oliver. Um, you said we should apply more, sorry, you should apply, we should more apply the mental models of respondents. Um, but those are different from our definitions, ILO, concepts, etc. So we will lose comparability of data. So it's it's not that I've 
completely thrown out the output needs. Definitely what I'm designing is meant to meet the output needs as well. It's just doing it in a way that fits with the way that the respondent thinks about it. Um, so their mental model's about talking about two jobs all at once rather than one first and one second or, um, you know, being able to, oh, this is a survey about um, economic activity, so I want to tell you that I'm retired straight away. I don't want to have to have to wait, that kind of thing. Actually, I've not found that it does impact too much on, on, on the actual definitional issues. And so this is kind of why it's important to go back to the concept, even though you can abandon the old question. As long as you're measuring the same concept, the comparability should be maintained. Yeah, okay, and um, we have one last question, again, also from Karen and Oliver. Um, which is, the transformation process takes long. How long will it last? What is the time schedule? Mm, yeah, so um, we've got the contest in October. We're trying to get ready for that. Uh, I'm not exact. I think 2019 is where the parallel run is planned for. And then the parallel run itself, if we decide to run it for 12 months, takes 12 months. So this this is why I'm thinking probably tentatively 2021 before there's there's a live transformed labor market version that replaces the existing lab before survey. Okay, um, we've had we've about, ooh, according to me, about two minutes left. We've got a last minute question from Dag, I think. Um, did you try the hours worked grid for actual work towers as well? Um, am I still sharing my screen? Uh, just a moment. Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. Um, so what we tried was was this, so we, we used to have it, what was your usual hours, kind of like this on its own on a page, what was your actual hours on its own on a page. If you had two jobs, however, it was doubled up, so it was main job, second job on the same page, but the only way we could get it to work was to have usual and actual hours contextualized next to each other. Um, so it, when it came to have sort of the usual hours version of this page, where it's what's in your main job, what's your usual hours, and in your second job, what's your usual hours. People don't have a problem with usual hours. They just default to their contracted, usually. And when you ask them what does usual mean to you, that's what they say about my contracted or typical hours. Um, but it's about getting them to think about, mm, did I work more or less than this week? That's the bit where people tend to be a little bit lazy, except where you really heavily handily juxtapose it one from the other. Okay, we have a last second um, question. I think you may have answered this already. It's Stephen. Will the LFS eventually move completely online or is the plan to run online alongside phone and face-to-face? -face? Yeah, so the, the plan will always be to keep the, the mixed mode um, model. Mm -hmm. okay, so I, I, don't think, I don't think there's even like plans about shrinking uh, field force or interviewer capacity or anything like that. So, I don't think it's going to affect kind of what we do in the in the field space. It'll just provide us this extra opportunity and this extra mode of data collection. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, then. I think we're out of time. Um, so, if anyone has any further questions, they they can email you. That's right, is it? Yes, please do. Yeah, please do. Be happy to take any emails. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. That was that was very very interesting. Um, and the session was recorded, um, so assuming the recording has worked, we'll be putting that and a PDF of the slides up on the UK Data Service website. And this will be in the news events, and if you just follow that through to events and past events, you should find the slides and recording up, hopefully in the next day or two. Okay, so that's fantastic. Thank you all for coming, and thanks again, Alex, for a fantastic presentation. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.